Hello, how is everybody? Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Audio sound all right. Hey, Narf. Hope you're doing well today. Glad you could make it. Yeah, probably uh, give things a couple minutes. Uh, but should get started fairly soon. Hello, John. Oh, thanks for everyone to for showing up. Uh, hope hope this will be a a good one. Uh, I'm I'm excited to get into the quantum mechanical world physics. Okay, I, I, I think can probably go ahead and get started. Um, so yeah, uh, of course, welcome. And uh, so what do we want to do today? So if you saw the last one, uh, this last stream, um, if you were here, if you saw it afterwards, whichever, um, what we did uh, was we wrote down the Schrodinger equation uh, essentially just as an extrapolation from classical mechanics. We were using um, uh, the Hamiltonian formulation of classical mechanics. We got to these so-called canonical transformations, and we saw that there were a lot of parallels between these canonical transformations and Fourier transformations. So basically what we said was, hey, you know, let's, let's try something. Um, and essentially replaced these uh, canonical transformations uh, with Fourier transformations. And at the end of the day, we got this equation, this Schrodinger equation. Uh, but we didn't really talk about this equation too much. In, in particular, we just sort of, we wrote it down in terms of this weird Hamiltonian operator thing. Um, we didn't really say what its solutions corresponded to, none of that. So that's hopefully the goal of this, uh, of, of this stream, is we're going to talk about um, the structure of the Schrodinger equation. We're going to get it into a more usable form, um, at least usable for the time being. Uh, we'll generalize it even further in the future. And then... Uh, We'll try to uh, figure out what the solutions actually mean. What, what's this equation actually telling us? And more importantly, is it physical? Uh, when we solve this equation, in, in principle, for it to actually be useful, it should tell us something about our physical world, and it should make some set of predictions that we can then test and see if the uh, predictions match what the theory says uh, should happen. Um, yeah, so Narf asked, was the motivation really just, hey, these look similar, or is there something more going on? I mean, so <laughs> from uh, from my side, uh, it, it was really, they, hey, these, these look similar, so let's see what happens. Let's run with this thread. Um, so the thing about... Uh, <laughs> I, I, I've talked about this a little bit in the past, um, uh, actually, when we were talking about gravity. When we went from Newtonian's gravity down to this Galilean, I'll, I'll write things out a bit more. So um, we we talked, if you if you remember, a, a while back, um, we were able to take uh, Newton's law of uh, gravity, and by considering um, some change changes in R which were uh, essentially much less than the uh, radius that we, that we were looking at, we found this reduced back down to this just constant gravitational 
um, uh, force law. And trust me, I'm, I'm getting somewhere with this. Um, it's, a, it's a very similar thing with, uh, with quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. So um, with quantum mechanics, and hopefully in the future we'll, we'll see this very neatly, uh, with quantum mechanics we can start here from the more general theory the the deeper more more physically relevant or more yeah I'll say deeper more quote unquote correct theory and we can take some limit and arrive at an approximate theory that is still correct as long as we don't stray too far away from certain conditions um so this is what happens with uh when we go from quantum uh to classical but if you remember uh, when we talked about this uh, particular case, this case of gravity, we could it, this was very one directional. We couldn't start with this mg case and derive Newton's uh, equations of gravity. It, you you just can't do it. It's it's not um, it, without some sort of outside knowledge. It, it's essentially too broad. Uh, there's there's too many options for you to specify to just one, and the same is essentially true here. You can't really start from classical mechanics and then take some limits or anything and then arrive at quantum mechanics. It it just doesn't work because classical mechanics is really a limit of quantum mechanics, and you can't get back um, without knowing some outside information. So. You have to essentially take some sort of leap at some point if you want to go from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics, and our leap was essentially just saying that these canonical transformations look a lot like Fourier transformations, so let's see what happens when we treat them that way. Okay? So, with all that said, um, great question. Um, what, what did we say? So what we said was that we had these Fourier transform pairs, and uh, in particular, we, we found two uh, important ones, two important pairs. Uh, pairs. The first is uh, the canonical um, coordinates are Fourier transform pairs with their uh, con uh, conjugate momenta. And then the second one uh, was a very similar relation between energy and time. And again, these this just uh, this just comes from uh, looking at the structure of these uh, uh, canonical transformations, seeing what generates what transformations, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so when we when we write all this out, uh, we ended up. Um, finding this equation, this i h bar uh, d by d t. So notice that this is in the time, the space parameterized by time, right? That's the important thing about Fourier transforms, is I can only live in the space parameterized by one or the other. I can't live in a space parameterized by both. So in the space parameterized by time, we found this equation where this uh, Hamiltonian operator, as we called it, this is our Hamiltonian operator. Um, this, this is just sort of our sh uh, a bit of shorthand notation for us um, so that we know that, okay, well, when I'm living in the uh, space parameterized by time, uh, my Hamiltonian operator acts in this way as, as essentially just a time derivative. And then if I live in the other space, so I'll write this as h hat acting on psi, actually I'll call it a lowercase psi, psi of x and energy, it just gives me back my energy. This is, this is how we define this Hamiltonian operator. It acts in different ways depending on which space we're living in. But you see that this, uh, this relation here uh, 
this essentially is our Fourier transform relation. And I, I know I'm, I'm repeating myself a lot from the last stream, and I'm, the reason why is I know it's been a while since I've done one of these, so I want to sort of get everyone kind of caught up. But essentially, we, we haven't done anything too crazy here. This is all just Fourier transforms. It goes back to Fourier transforms. Sort of the weirdest thing that we've done is included this constant of h bar, but that's basically just to keep track of units. Okay, so um, something that I sort of briefly said uh, last time, which I want to talk about a little bit more, is that I said, okay, essentially what we do for, to find this Hamiltonian operator, we take the Hamiltonian, the classical Hamiltonian, and we upgrade all of our um, canonical momenta and canonical uh, coordinates, and we just, we just upgrade them to their operator forms. Um, so uh, if you recall, if I have a conservative system in classical mechanics, um, I can write this as uh, one half. Uh, we had this G inverse operator, or G inverse object. Uh, which is a function of my coordinates, pi, pj, plus u, u, l. Okay, so this is all well and good for classical mechanics, right? Now, to find the evolution of our system classically, we just take the derivatives, we find Hamilton's equations of motions, and we're good to go. But now, if I want to find h hat, um, and I want to do this very naively by just taking, um, you know, all of my pi's and I upgrade them to operators, uh, similar for qi's and I upgrade them to q operators. Where again, this operator form is just telling us that this thing is going to act on our uh, functions. In this case, we might call it psi. Um, it's going to act differently depending on which space we choose to parameterize the function by. So if we were to very naively plug this in, we see that, okay, in, in this term here, I'll, I'll use red, in, in our potential energy term, no, nothing really bad is going to happen. We can, we can just take uh, u q sub l, and we can upgrade this to an operator the same way. Um, I'm going to change the name a little bit. I'm going to call it v. And the reason why I'm going to call this uh, v is uh, just to not get it confused with the time evolution operator, which we already gave the name of u. Okay. So this is all. This is fine. This this. I can put a green check mark by. We don't run into any problems here. But the kinetic energy piece is a little bit more problematic uh, because of the fact that, uh, okay, well, in classical mechanics, I can write this um, product basically any way that I want, right? I can write this as pi. Ugh times g inverse ij ql pj and all, all of these are equivalent um, and here hopefully you see where we're running where we'll run into an issue so if i try to just sort of naively upgrade ah, um, this g i j inverse u sub l. If I try to just upgrade this to g hat i j u hat l, um, this whole story no longer works, and it doesn't work because of the fact that, uh, as we said last time, uh, these operators do not commute. So I can't change the order of these guys for free. Um, and so since our, uh, since our operator form of this gij uh, is a function of 
our Q hat operators. This means that we can't move uh, our G operator past our momentum operators for free in this exactly the same way. So these two things aren't equivalent, which means that we now have to look at this product and essentially figure out which one of these we need to use because we have to uh, we have to take in, into account the fact that the order that we put these things in matters. Uh, there's there's sort of a even easier way of seeing this, and this is if I if I put everything in um, if I do everything in coordinate space. So in terms of cues, in which case my momentum operator uh, is going to become I believe minus i h bar b by d q, and you see that if I try to have something like g inverse i j p hat j acting on um, psi uh, in coordinate space, this is just g inverse q of the q's. Uh, minus i h bar deep psi eq j but now if i flip everything i have p hat j i j psi well now i first act with the g's and then i get something like p hat times g inverse i j u sub l uh, times psi and you see now I'm getting a derivative of this whole thing. Uh, so this is d by dq uh, j of g i. I know I'm running out of space. But you, you see that clearly these two things aren't going to be equivalent uh, if um, g i j is not a trivial function of q's. So if, it, if, it, if the g depends on q's, uh, then obviously these two things aren't going to be equal to each other. So we have to figure out the ordering of these things. And probably the best way of doing that is to sort of stray away from our index notation. Um, so the, the reason why we're able to shift everything around up here uh, in this equation here is because we're using this index notation where we're essentially treating everything as just a, a scalar. It's a, it's a number, it's a piece of a vector or a matrix or whatever, but it's just a number. So we're free to move it around in this product no matter uh, however we want. So we're gonna have to sort of stray away from that notation and probably the best place to go is to just go into matrix notation instead. Um, because we know that matrices also have this property that you can't always just move them past each other uh, in a product. So we'll, we'll see why that is here. So say I want to find a, a scalar product between two vectors, u and v. I know that this is u1, uh, v1, plus u2, v2, plus dot 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 plus u n v n. Uh, but I can write this in uh, a uh, so-called matrix notation as what I'll call a row vector, uh, which is just an array of uh, the elements of u, times a column vector, which is just the um, similar array um, which has the elements of v. So this is the rules, this is essentially the rule for matrix multiplication, is, is we take rows and we multiply by columns and we pair up each of the individual pieces. So we pair up u1, v1, u2, v2, so on and so forth. We multiply them and we add them all up. This is the rule for matrix multiplication. Uh, another way that I ri might write this is uh, u transpose times v. 
where transpose just means that I take any rows um, and I replace them with columns and vice versa. So if u is usually a uh, column vector, like v here, I transpose it by taking my rows to columns and columns to rows, which gives me a row vector. Okay. So now uh, we want a uh, we want matrix multiplication on top of this. So this is vector multiplication, so we want matrix multiplication. Um, yeah, uh, as, as Lord is saying, uh, this, is, this is just a, a, an inner product. This is exactly an inner product, right? Because we, we would usually write this as u dot b, yeah. So um, you can see that we don't want just the product of two vectors because g i j is a matrix, right? It has, it has two elements to it, which means that it has both rows and columns. So what I want to look at is something where I might have a matrix, call it M, which is going to be M11, M12, dot, 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 M1N, and then so on down here, where this would end up giving me MN1, so on, MNN, diagonal this way. So this is my matrix. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of consolidate this matrix into a bunch of different uh, column vectors, essentially. So what I can do is I can write this as a um, row vector of column vectors. Um, one, and I'll just write this as M, N. Uh, so now I can just apply the rules of what I had before uh, and find this product here, which is just going to be M1, uh, M1, V1, plus M2, V2, plus blah, blah, plus M, N, V, N, where the M vectors are these column vectors here. Uh, the columns of this matrix, and the v's are just the elements of the v vector. So um, you can see that this just gives me a, a vector at the end of the day, right? This, this is going to end up giving me actually a column vector because each one of these are column vectors. And so just by the standard rules of multiplying vectors by numbers and adding them together, I still get a column vector. So putting this together, if I want to get a scalar out, so notice up here, uh, I guess I'll write it down here, when I'm writing these uh, gij inverse pi pj, I don't have any free indices floating around. I'm summing over anything or everything. So this is going to give me a scalar. And so you see before, to take two vectors and to get a scalar, I did this uh, u transpose v sort of thing. And so uh, we can see that uh, a similar um, scalar product involving a matrix is going to be something like u transpose m v. Right, uh, just because I want to pair up the m and the v to get a column vector, and then I multiply that by the transpose of the um, of the uh, other vector that I have. So you can see that the correct ordering for things in matrix form is going to be essentially my matrix sandwiched between my two vectors. Uh, so this tells us, or this gives us a good idea that the correct ordering that we should use is something uh, like this for our kinetic term. OK, I know that was sort of a lightning uh, round of uh, matrix math, but 
it's it the the using matrices right now isn't going to be super relevant but just this is just a quick and dirty argument for why we should use this ordering of our operator but um yeah so uh so i'm i'm going to take a quick pause here see if there are questions and See uh, where I'm. Where am I from? I'm from, and you couldn't tell. I'm from the states. Um, but yeah, that's uh, I I'm I'm from the West originally. <laughs> the metric tensor is feeling very ignored right now. It's uh, uh, hold hold your horses, hold your horses. We'll we'll get to that. I'll I'll, I'll mention that um as, as well. But that, that's a, it's a great observation because we, we essentially are using a metric tensor right now. And then ah, we have a great question, which is what's the difference between a matrix and a tensor? Um, so I'll give the cop-out answer <laughs> that uh, a tensor is something that transforms like a tensor, whereas a matrix is a two-index object. Um, so... Uh, Basically, a, a, a tensor, so for something to be a tensor, uh, it has to cr uh, transform in the correct way. Um, and off the top of my head, I do always get this confused. Uh, so if I have, if I take some set of coordinates to a different set of coordinates, uh, then if I have a tensor, I1, I2, whatever. And the, this gets tricky because you have covariant, contravariant tensors, whatever. We'll start with a two-index object. Um, this is, I believe, D, I'm not mistaken, it should be D, Q, EQ prime, EQ, EQ prime, um, and then this one should be, uh, I think I, uh, wait, no, sorry, I'm, this is M, N, I1, I2, T, uh, M, N. So that's our transform tensor. This is the transformation for a tensor. This is very specific to tensors. If it doesn't transform this way, it's not a tensor, I, I think. And then, so this is uh, very specifically a covariant tensor. If, if it's a contravariant, then uh, essentially you, you flip these derivatives. You, you uh, turn them upside down. Um, a matrix can be a just more general uh, uh, object, or two, uh, two index object. So I can have a matrix which has two indices that doesn't transform this way. That's, that's the difference. So a, a, mat uh, a two index tensor is a very specific uh, subset of matrices. Uh, a, a, another thing about tensors is that they can be any any number of indices that I want. So I can have I1, I2, up to I n, J1, J2, J n, and as long as it transforms in this way, it's going to be called a tensor. Whereas you wouldn't call something like this a matrix. Yeah, so I, I see Narf in the in the chat um, uh, recommending write it. Eigen Chris uh for those later on talking about uh tensors and tensor calculus but anyway okay uh so let's let's get back to our quantum mechanics so this is this is this is great because now we can actually write down a more usable form of our Hamiltonian operator because now we know how everything is ordered. So we can write this as pi gij hat inverse u hat j plus v hat 
you have oh. where I, I literally mean when I'm writing these things as functions, I'm, I'm literally taking the version from classical mechanics and just taking all of the instances of the P's and the Q's and replacing them with the operator forms. Uh, so within within the G's, since G only depends on the Q's, the Q's all, the, they don't all, none of those depend on each other. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't have to worry about things, uh, the ordering of things within the G's and the V's, but only when I'm mixing P's and Q's. Um, okay. So this is our form of our Hamiltonian operator. This is great. Um, so let's... Um, Uh, let's specify to uh, some particular forms. And, and so we'll, we'll start off by considering everything in position space, uh, which means that we're gonna write everything in terms of Q's, not P's. Um, and more specifically, we'll start off with the simple case of Cartesian coordinates. Uh, uh, and to coordin oh wow, coordinates. To stay consistent uh, with uh, um, what, what I've been doing in the past, I, I've always called Cartesian coordinates uh, x and then more, our more general coordinates, q. Okay, so we can, we can look at this, and we know that our p hats are um, gonna be given by minus i h bar, uh, specifically p hat acting on psi of x. I don't care what other spaces I'm working in, the only thing that matters is uh, x here. This is minus i h bar uh, deep psi dx i. And then my uh, g function g inverse i j hat uh, we'll say q hat l being on psi x l this is just g my classical g inverse with cartesian coordinates which is just given in terms of the kronecker delta uh where here in this expression i'm not summing over i i is not summed uh, where, and mi, I should say, is the mass of our ith degree of freedom. So this, this can be any number of degrees of freedom we want, and the index, uh, or mi, just tells us that when we're dealing with um, the degree of freedom, freedom corresponding to i, it's that mass. So, um, we can write down our Hamiltonian acting on uh, this psi of x, whatever else. Uh, and this is just going to be minus. Uh, I'll explicitly put in the sum to not uh, get things confused. h bar squared over 2mi squared. Uh, d2 psi dx squared plus v x psi x so on and this is the form of our hamiltonian that's that's pretty neat we're uh we're able to uh write this down fully i should dx i squared sorry i'm gonna put this in a big red box okay this is this is great, and this I should write. This is for Cartesian 
Cartesian coordinates. X, I. Very specific to Cartesian coordinates. Okay, so now here's the issue. There's always got to be an issue. Um, now, say we make an invertible transformation, right? So invertible transformation uh, from our Cartesian coordinates. So x i is going to go to q sub i x l. And what do I mean by invertible? By invertible, I just mean that uh, dx i dq uh, I'll call this M, DQM, DXJ is equal to delta IJ. That's all I mean by invertible. So, what, what happens if I make this uh, transformation? Well, okay. When I take the derivative, so d by d x i, say acting on psi, uh, now say I, I rewrite psi in terms of these new coordinates q. Well, then I, I have to take that into account by using the chain rule, right? So this is just going to be uh, dq, we'll call this m, dx i, d psi, dq m. But what we also found in the past is that uh, our, uh, um, our matrix gij is going to also change. So if I write gij in terms of Cartesian coordinates, this is going to be given by some new uh, dxi, dqm, dxj, dqn, g inverse mn, U sub L. Now what we saw in uh, the classical case when we were just dealing with the classical Hamiltonian is, okay, we saw a similar transformation of the P's here. The P's transformed in a similar way and the G transformed in this exact same way here. And so when I had this product of PI, G inverse, IJ, PJ, you can see that everything canceled out and the, the term it's, itself stayed exactly the same. But here, that's not going to exactly be the case uh, because, well, when I, when I write down um, this, uh, so I'll, I'll write it h bar squared over 2 d by d x i. So this is my kinetic term that I'm writing out, the inverse i j, d psi d x uh, j. Right, this is, this is the kinetic term, just replacing everything with operators. And this, uh, when I make this transformation, I find that this no longer is going to look the same. Uh, dx i, d by d q sub k, uh, d x i, d q m g inverse m j of q q spells e psi e q j let me lasso this stuff move it so it's a little bit clearer so things don't stay the same anymore okay so, so now we have to be a little bit careful when we're writing down this kinetic term. And this is, this is messy. This is, this is kind of messy and gross. Um, but remember, this is for the case of an arbitrary number of particles and an arbitrary number of dimensions. So to make our life a little bit easier, let's start by uh, considering just the single particle case. Uh, particle case, uh, which basically just means that every single degree of freedom is going to have the same mass, 
And that, that simplifies my life a little bit because I can re rewrite uh, my g inverse as one over m. I'll give it the little g i j u sub l. And this is gonna make Narf very happy because this actually is the inverse metric tensor on our space. Um, I, it's not super um, important and it, it's a little bit of a side tangent, but just to quickly show it, um, I, from the transformation rules or from the definition of G inverse IJ, I can see that I can define uh, little g ij uh, in terms of Cartesian coordinates uh, as qi dxm dqj dxn. Oh, this should be m. All right, so, so when I say that this is a metric tensor, what do I mean? What do, what do I mean by this? So we can first of all see that this, this is a, ten, uh, a tensor. It transforms exactly how I was saying tensors transform. Um, and just to see that this actually is really the inverse metric tensor, uh, we, can, we can think of a, a, a line element. So, so say we have some path in our space. Like I said, this is a bit of a side tangent, but it, it's good to sort of address this as it comes up in my opinion. Um, say we have some path in, sp in our space and we split it up into a very small piece, which we'll call ds. Well, we know that the, the length of ds, so, so um, ds squared, we can find this just in Cartesian coordinates. So if we're dealing with flat space and Cartesian coordinates, this is just going to be given by the Pythagorean theorem. Right, so this is a little change in the first direction plus the little change in the second direction, so on, and depending on however many directions I have, I can go up to n. Uh, which I can, of course, rewrite in my summation convention is dxi dxi. Um, now we can shift our coordinates. We can change our coordinates, xi going to q sub i, L. In which case, again, I can just use my chain rule to find that dxi is dxi dq um, m dq m. So you see that this same small uh, small piece of the path is given by uh, dxi dqm, dqm, uh, dxi, dqn, qn, which I can just define as some object, which I'll call gmn, dqm, dqn. For now, this guy is actually my metric tensor. Uh, get a little bit of insight as to why it's called a metric tensor because it gives me a distance, right? It gives me a metric. It gives me a measurement of how separated things are. Um, and hopefully it's, it's fairly easy to see. So here gmn is going to be dxi, dqm, dxi, dqn. So hopefully it's pretty clear that this guy here is just the inverse of this guy here. So quick and dirty explanation again of how this is actually metric tensor. So now you can live on happy with the knowledge that the metric tensor exists outside of general relativity. And actually, I, I think keeping this in mind, this, this metric tensor is, uh, is very useful uh, for when you want to change coordinates. It's, I personally find it much more helpful to use the metric tensor. Um, yeah, so uh, as Narf is saying, yeah, the, the um, metric tensor defines the inner product, and this is exactly how it defines the inner product. We want 
you know, so in a in a well, on a Ramanian manifold, uh, the distance is um, yeah, it, it's it's just given in this way, um, and so we define this object, which is the metric tensor, which uh, takes that into account. Anyway, so side tangent. Um, after this side tangent, we can go back to uh, our Hamiltonian. Um, H hat, psi, U, L, so on and so forth. Um, no, no, Narf, don't worry. I, I was planning on going into that anyway. Uh, that, that, was, that was part of the plan. You didn't derail me. I derailed myself. But so let's, let's rewrite everything in terms of uh, this little g. Uh, dqk, dxi, d by d, uh, uk, dxi, d, q, m, d inverse, m, j, q sub l, uh, d by d, q, j, plus our potential term, psi, I'll just write it as psi, understanding that we're working in q coordinates, all that. Uh, what's an inner product? Oh, um, an inner product is essentially just something that uh, gives us a, a distance. Uh, it, it gives us an idea of the distance between two things. So it's, um, yeah, so between two vectors, it's more commonly known as a, a dot product. Uh, but you can have an inner product between two tensors. You can have an inner product between two functions. It just it sort of depends, and you can play around with definitions of the inner product, etc., and get um, interesting uh, results. But essentially, the idea is you can't have a space uh, without a definition of an inner product because you have to be able to measure distances on the space. That's what the inner product does. And actually, in quantum mechanics, we'll we'll see we'll see uh, a, a definition of an inter, an inner product, um, which is a bit different than what you might be used to, as uh, the spaces that we'll be working in are infinite dimensional. Uh, so we need something a little bit more uh, generalizable. In particular, an inner product between functions is what we'll find. Okay, uh, so I, I'm going to go ahead and rewrite this in a bit more compact way uh, using uh, this thing here, uh, plus v l psi, where I just defined all this junk uh, here as this del squared. So this is dqk, dxi, d by dqk. And remember that all, all of this is relating us back to what things look like in Cartesian coordinates. So that's why this x is always showing up, is this gives us a very easy way of deriving what these things look like, because in principle, um, we should always be able to backtrack our way to Cartesian coordinates and just sort of step by step make these um, coordinate transformations. But I, I mean, this is messy. This uh, this is uh, more formally known as the Laplacian Laplacian operator. Um, but so uh, if we were to go back to Cartesian coordinates, uh, we get a very nice. Uh, explanation of what this Laplacian operator actually is because, well, this guy is just going to be a Kronecker delta, this is a Kronecker delta, this is a Kronecker delta, and we're left with del squared psi is just the sum uh, of all of my second derivatives in Cartesian coordinates. Um, so th this, this gives us a, a nice 
idea of what the Laplacian operator is actually telling us. It's essentially just a second derivative, but it's going to look really messy in uh, non-Cartesian coordinates because of just transforming to those coordinates. And yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't mind questions at all. I, I, I like these questions. Uh, it's always fun interacting with you guys, so please feel free to ask questions you like. Okay, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna write this out one more time, but I'm gonna actually sub I'm gonna write down the Schrodinger equation, and I'm gonna actually substitute this Hamiltonian operator that we found, and we're gonna get d call it capital psi dt is equal to minus h bar squared over two m del squared psi plus vql, depending on what coordinates we're using, psi ql. And remember, this is just in position space. This is not in momentum space. Uh, if we were to do things in momentum space, this would be a lot trickier because uh, the v's, as well as the gij's, are going to now be essentially a whole jumble of derivatives. But so this is the Schrodinger equation. Equation in time and position space. Uh, space. Okay. So the 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 space which is parameterized by our q's and our t. So something that we can immediately notice about this is that um, outside of psi itself, the right-hand side of this equation, this right-hand side here, has no dependence on time. Whereas the left-hand side here uh, only has dependence on time, right? The, the left-hand side only cares about what's happening with time. The right-hand side only cares what's happening with space. Um, so we can go ahead and um, do our, uh, something we've done in the past, which is separation of variables, right? Uh, we're going we're gonna to assume that Psi has some solution, which I'll call uh, Q of our Q sub L's, and then T of T. Um, Yes, I'm seeing the comment of space-time. Be a little bit careful because this isn't quite space-time yet because um, we're still separating time and space. Time and space are still very separate entities in what we're dealing with right now. Um, in, in the future, when we talk about relativity, well, special relativity, general relativity, uh, you'll, what you'll see is that space and time can then mix. Um, the question, another question is, what's the difference between total energy and the Hamiltonian? Um, so in classical mechanics, as long as I have a conservative system, meaning that energy is uh, conserved, there is no difference between the total energy and the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian will give me my total energy. Uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, total energy doesn't necessarily really make sense to talk about. Um, that coming from the fact that, uh, if I want to write my wave function psi, uh, as a function of time, etc., uh, this is, a, uh, this is really some integral over all energies, uh, right? The, going back to the fact that this whole formalism, uh, is... Uh, related to Fourier transforms. Uh, so really it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to talk about the exact energy of our system or the total energy of our system. Um, because really, I mean, at the end of the day, we have to take a linear combination of all energies of the system, each one weighted differently. Okay. 
We can, of course, talk about average energy, as I'll talk about uh, in the future, but um, for, for right now, uh, and, and this is if we're talking in uh, the time domain. If we're talking about the energy domain, uh, then the Hamiltonian, again, essentially just gives us a single value of energy, which um, I'll uh, bring up here. So if I make this substitution into the Schrodinger equation, uh, I can essentially divide everything by psi, and the net result is that I get something like t dt is equal to minus h bar squared over 2m red squared q over q plus v of q bell. Now, if you notice, the left-hand side here is just a function of time. This is only a function of time. And the right-hand side is only a function of, uh, of the cues. And hopefully it doesn't take too much arguing uh, to say that these two sides have to not only be equal to each other, but equal to a constant. Right? I know that the right-hand side over here doesn't depend on time. The left-hand side only depends on time. So for these two to be equal, each side has to be equal to a constant. The same goes for space. OK? So I'm going to call that uh, constant E. And I'm going to write this as essentially just multiplying through both sides. Uh, e times t, and then I have minus h bar squared over 2m rad squared q plus v l q is equal to e times q. Now if you notice, uh, this, this uh, equation here is essentially just our restatement of our, I'll write it, um, uh, our Schrodinger equation in energy space instead of time space. Appreciate the support, Nova Warrior. Thanks for showing up. Um, yeah, so this is just a restatement of that uh, equation. So now we're at a point where, OK, now we just have to specify our potential v and solve this equation, right? That, that's, that's everything that this comes down to, is that we've done this sort of separation of variables uh, story. We've gotten everything down to two differential equations. So now all we have to do is solve those differential equations. And that's basically what quantum mechanics is. Quantum mechanics is solving these equations. That's, that's what uh, pretty much all quantum mechanics comes down to. So here, I'm, I'm, I'll take another pause. I, I hope that doesn't underwhelm anybody, but that's, um, I, I, I find it, uh, I, I always find it kind of funny uh, when people talk about quantum mechanics as this wild, mysterious, uh, scary thing, when at the end of the day, th this is it. This is quantum mechanics for you. Um, but it's, a uh, yeah, it's kind of fun. So I'm going to take a break, and then we'll get into actually trying to interpret what these uh, solutions will, will tell us. Feel free to ask any questions or anything you to clarify. <laughs> yes, quantum mechanics is math. <laughs> but yeah, so so at at, at this point, a, a lot of quantum mechanics, once we interpret what it all means. Um, well, if we want to solve things in position space, say, 
it just comes down to um, figuring out how to solve differential equations. Now, there, there's a lot more insight that can be come, um, uh, that can come from, uh, come from this whole story of quantum mechanics. And actually, with this, this fantastic question of this is all in a Hilbert space, what is a Hilbert space? Um, so that's, that's this beautiful thing that I think I, I'm not going to get to until probably two streams from now. But uh, this all, yes, this all lives in a Hilbert space, which is just, it's a vector space, right? So I can define some vectors, which are these psi's, and um, I, there's just a certain set of rules that uh, the space that these guys live in abide by. Um, so the important thing about it all of this story living in a Hilbert space is that I'm free to choose my basis. So just like in, in like three-dimensional space, I can choose my coordinate axes however I want. I can choose my basis, which spans my Hilbert space, to be essentially whatever I want. And we're already seeing this, right? We're sort of secretly seeing all of this in all of this machinery where I'm free to sort of choose, okay, do I want to solve this in position space and momentum space and energy space and time space. I, I can choose these things. Um, and it's all still well defined. It all still works. Um, th this is, that's what's important about it living in a Hilbert space. The Hilbert space is just, uh, it's essentially telling us that the solutions to the Schrodinger equation satisfy a set of rules. And I'll, I'll, I'll get to what those rules are, but I mean, they're not too... Um, uh, too too wild, and actually the, they're very intuitive based off of what we already know of vector. Uh, another question of what is capital T? So capital T just comes from this uh, separation of variables, um, where we notice that the left-hand side only has time derivatives, the right-hand side only has space derivatives, and this v only depends on spatial coordinates. So we split our, our, our function psi uh, into a piece which only depends on coordinates and a piece which only depends on time, and we see this uh, sort of complete separation of the equation where the left-hand side only depends on time. The right hand side only depends on space and so each side has to be equal to a constant for this equality to be satisfied okay uh can you help me understand the relation between the hamiltonian operator and energy clearly very close but what is the exact connection I already talked about it just say so uh so yeah i, I sort of briefly touched on this um so in the case that we're working in the space spanned by energy, right? So we, we have this Fourier transform relationship between energy and time. So if I choose to be working in the energy space, when I act on a function, uh, right, a, a function in that space will depend on the energy. Uh, then when I act with the Hamiltonian operator, I get the energy. I get that energy. Right, so that's that's what this is saying here. That's what E is. Uh, however, if I'm working in time, the time domain, it actually doesn't really make sense to talk about energy because I, it's, it's not part of the problem anymore. I Fourier transformed energy out of the equation. Right, it's it's the same thing for position and momentum. Where if I decide to work in momentum space. It doesn't make sense to talk about position because, well, I Fourier transformed and uh, essentially integrated out position. Uh, so in that case, the, the um, Hamiltonian essentially gives me how my system evolves through time. So there are very separate interpretations, um, but the, the energy space um, relation that I have written over here uh, is just very closely related to the fact that if I have a conservative system in classical mechanics, the Hamiltonian gives me my total energy. It's the same thing. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, Q, Q is Q is my Q sub i's are coordinates. Uh, and yeah, in, in principle, so, you know, uh, Q sub i could be like R theta phi. This could be R phi z, whatever. Um, yeah, it, it's a, as Narf said, it's what we call a generalized coordinate, right? So this is essentially to uh generalize as much as we can so that we're free to use the coordinate system which is best adapted to our problem so if we want to have a, or if we have like a spherically symmetric system uh, we're going to want to use these coordinates uh, if we have a cylindrically symmetrical system here uh we that if we have a yes rectangularly symmetric system we'd want to use cartesian so on it just gives us a little more freedom to write things in terms of these generalized cues instead of sticking to always Cartesian coordinates. Okay, so now we, uh, I mean, I, I guess I can draw a box around these equations. Um, sure. Uh, now, now that we have these equations, uh let's let's try to figure out what the solutions to these i mean like i said solving these equations isn't going to be super enlightening because it's just solving differential equations um but what is going to be enlightening is figuring out well what the heck do these solutions mean what do they correspond to um and actually it turns out that in the Schrodinger equation, there's a lot of information there. There's a ton of information there. Um, but we have, to, we have to be a little tricky in how we extract that information. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to start again with this Schrodinger equation. Uh, deep psi dt is equal to h hat psi. And now I'm going to complex conjugate it. And why we're doing this, I don't expect to be immediately obvious to anyone, but um, let's just go with the flow uh, and see what comes out. Uh, so when we conjugate everything, in general, psi is going to be complex. Uh, so we have to conjugate it as well. Uh, and so when we complex conjugate everything, we end up with something like this. The minus sign just coming from the fact that, well, I have an i. So whenever I have an i, I give it minus i when I complex conjugate. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply, uh, multiply this equation by uh, psi star. I'm going to multiply this equation by psi. And then I'm going to subtract the two. OK? And so now you sort of see why, I, why I'm going about this. Because the left-hand side, when I do this, I get something like i h bar times i of star d by dt plus, right, I have this minus minus psi d psi star dt, which I can rearrange, and I see that this is a total derivative. This is a total time derivative. i h bar d psi star psi dt. So that's what happens on the left-hand side. I get a total derivative, which is always sort of nice to see happen. Uh, the right-hand side, so I can just set this equal to what shows up on the right-hand side, psi star h hat psi uh, minus h hat psi star psi. Okay, so now what we'll do, we're going to plug in our definition of the Hamiltonian. So we'll plug in, plug in the definition of h, and just I, I know I've probably done it a few times, 
in this context, when I'm talking about the Hamiltonian, I'm talking about the Hamiltonian operator, not the, the Hamiltonian from classical mechanics. I should have clarified that earlier, uh, so I, I apologize if that caused any confusion. Um, but so in, in quantum contexts, I'll, I'll talk about the Hamiltonian as the Hamiltonian operator. Um, okay, so I'm going to plug in our definition of H. I'm going to use the fact that our del squared, as well as our Q's, say in position space, uh, are real. Right, I mean, assuming our coordinates are real, all of the derivatives should be real, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, when I write that down, I get an equation like, well, this, let's write it as this piece here, is going to give me something like h bar squared over 2m times psi star del squared psi minus psi del squared psi star. The potential term cancels out because, well, it's real, so I get a real number times psi, psi, psi star psi in each term, and I get those just drop out. Okay, so now we're going to specialize to Cartesian coordinates, and I, I, I don't always love doing this, but it's where it's the most clear. Um, and so... You can prove it in more general, but it, it's a lot more cumbersome. And so I, I want to specialize to Cartesian just to sort of get the point across. Uh, so specialize to Cartesian, where, again, remember that in Cartesian coordinates, this del squared just becomes um, uh, a second derivative. And now we can use a property, that just essentially use the product rule for derivatives, um, where if I have some function a sub x l d by d x i uh, d b d x i, so this is the Laplacian acting on b, so this is like this term where psi star is a and psi is b. I can rewrite this as, uh, again, just some total derivative of a times db dxi minus da dxi db dxi. So now you see that when I apply this to both of these terms here, so I apply this to this term here and to this term here, each term is going to get something like minus d psi dxi, d psi star dxi. And since I have a relative minus sign, those terms are going to cancel. Terms are going to drop out. Uh, so I'm left with each term just having this piece. So again, I have a total derivative. Uh, so again, I'll just write this as equals minus h bar squared over 2m d by d x i, and what I end up with is something like psi star d psi d x i minus uh, psi d psi star d x i. Okay, so. Now I can put this all together and I'm gonna I'm gonna condense everything. I'm gonna define this thing which I'll call rho uh, as psi star psi, and then I'm gonna call j sub i uh, this this guy here. So this is gonna be j i psi star d psi dx i minus psi d psi star uh, dxi. 
And now with these very convenient definitions, uh, I, I see that my equation simplifies quite nicely. Uh, so d j i d x i, where I'm, I'm summing over indices here. Uh, I can write this in a different way if people prefer it. Uh, this is del dot j. Oops. J. Um, where del uh, is my vector derivative that we've dealt with before. Okay, so a couple things to notice. Uh, that both rho, rho and j, i, these are real. Um, rho is very simple to see because it's psi star psi, so it's a, it's a magnitude of a number. Um, and actually, since it's a magnitude, we can also see that not only is rho real, but it's greater than or equal to zero because it's a magnitude of a complex number. Uh, J is a little, oh, shoot, wait, I, um, I messed up here somewhere. Uh, I apologize. Definitely made a mistake here. Um, I minus I. Ah. That's why. Uh, so I, I have to I have to divide everything by this ih bar, right? So I, I'm I'm going to divide everything by this ih bar, um, and the end result is I get in my ah, well this is so I I divide this by ih bar as well to essentially just isolate the row on the right hand side, in which case my j pull that along with it, aren't I? Yep. Uh, is equal to i h bar over 2m times d. There we go. And that's how we see that j is real. Uh, because I, I complex conjugate everything in here, and I get a minus sign. Um, And then I complex conjugate the factor of i, and I get a another minus sign. So it maintains po or it stays positive when it's real. Um, okay. Uh, I have a I have a quick question. Is 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 everything okay on the stream? Is is thing are things like choppy or anything? Uh, I just ask because I'm getting notifications that uh, YouTube isn't getting enough video to keep things smooth. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure see if I have to mess with anything. Ah, okay. Is it is it better now? Okay, okay, good. Sorry, I just wanted to check. Okay, so um, the interesting thing about this equation here is that it's a so-called continuity equation. Uh, continuity equation. Uh, or uh, actually, sorry, uh, a conservation equation. Uh, conservation equation. Uh, so to see why this is, what we're going to do is we're going to integrate both sides over space. So say we're working in n-dimensional space. We can integrate this guy, dnx. Uh, d rho 
ET. Uh, this is, we'll just call some uh, D by DTP. Just, just give it some name. And then the right hand side, I have something like DNX, uh, DJI. I'm going to actually rewrite it as del dot j, a little bit more suggestive of a form. Because in the past, we've dealt with this uh, by using Gauss's law, which essentially tells us that when we're integrating the total divergence of a vector field, right, we're, we're figuring out how much of a vector field is leaving a point, we can say that that's equal to the flux of that field going through some surface. So the way that we say that is ds n hat. Uh, I'll call this n hat i j i where n hat is the unit normal to the surface, and of course ji is still our vector, our, our current it's ji that we defined up here. Uh, so typically, uh, I want this here is telling me how much is coming in or leaving a point, and I want to figure out the total sum of everything uh, entering or leaving. And so I can just figure out how much is going through uh, this surface. Ah, uh, shoot. Um, <laughs> it's probably not your internet. It's probably mine. Let's see. Mess with this. Yeah, sorry about this, guys. I uh, love to not be having internet troubles. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's on my end. I, uh... I need to figure out how to fix it. Also <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah, just just let me know if it ends up getting better. Um, uh, ah, there we go. Yeah, the weather has been a, a little stormy here. I don't know. I think that my internet is also a bit unreliable, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but okay, I, I think it's it's better now. Should hopefully be good. Okay, so anyway, as I was saying, all we've done here is asked how much of this blue vector field is leaving some point or going into that point, and the right-hand side is just saying, okay, well, we sum up everything that's going out of this surface, S. Okay. And on the, on the left-hand side, all we've done is defined this uh, quantity uh, as rho. Uh, the spatial integral of rho. Um, okay. I would love to demand an inter internet upgrade in the name of science. Okay, so now here's, here's a trick. Is, well, we're integrating over all space, and so this surface S 
is really going to be the surface where uh, x uh, well x goes to infinity, right? This is the the boundary of our space. Um, that this is what this surface S is. But so what we want to do is we typically want to deal with so-called well-behaved functions. Um, so I'll write this as well-behaved uh, functions, which just means that uh, the, the functions should themselves vanish. So uh, I'll write this as limit as r goes to infinity, f of r, those should vanish. And the same thing uh, for all derivatives. And, and this is pretty typical when we're dealing with physical systems, even just differential equations in general, we tend to be concerned with functions like this. Um, yes, I, I agree, Hendrik, physics is fun. Um, so we, we tend to be concerned with these sorts of functions. But you see that, well, j is made up of psi and derivatives of psi, and we're evaluating it at this surface at infinity. Which means that this right-hand side here should go to zero. Right, if we, if we require that this is a well-behaved function. So all in all, putting all of this together, we have that this, whatever this p is, the p dt is always zero. So p is a conserved quantity. But notice, notice we never, uh, never made an assumption uh, about the exact system. Uh, so we never, never chose, um, we never chose a form of our potential. Uh, so we can't say that this is like some conserved charge or conserved momentum or anything like that because we could always think up some uh, Hamiltonian which breaks that breaks the symmetry corresponding to that to that conserved quantity. So for any physical system for the types of Hamiltonians we're considering, any single one, this is a conserved quantity, which is kind of weird. It, it seems a little strange that this would be showing up. Um, uh, so what the, what the heck is this? Well, from this we can, for this we can sort of turn to math. Right, so what what is what is p? So p is this. Um, it, it's essentially a sum of all of these pieces of rho. Um, really, rho times a small volume. Well, in math, we know of something that is always the same value, um, which is a sum of individual pieces. And that's a probability, a, or in particular, a total probability. So uh, if I have some set of probabilities, um, which I'll call pi, right? So, so I have some set of probabilities pi for things to happen, right? A coin flip, each, each uh, I have probability of heads, which is one half, probability of tails, one half. I sum them up and I get one, always. Any system, no matter what, I don't care, probability always adds up to one, okay? Which means that our uh, time derivative of our total probability is also going to be one, or, or sorry, gonna be zero because the time derivative is zero. So, um, 
Okay. So now we take this to the continuum case, and we see that, well, in the same sort of, uh, in the same sort of um, notation, well, I can just replace the sum by an integral, dnx rho x uh, t, and the same story plays out, as long as I require that this is equal to 1. And of course, this will be conserved if each one of these guys is the probability at each point, essentially within this volume dnx. Okay, so this is this is sort of hand wavy, but another piece of uh, of the evidence to support this is the fact that uh, rho is greater than or equal to zero. Right? We said rho is the uh, the magnitude of a complex number. So it always has to be greater than or equal to zero, which is exactly what we expect from an individual probability. So yeah, it seems a little hand wavy, um, but let's, again, this is one of the things that let's go with it. We don't really have anything better to interpret P as, so let's give it a shot. Um, and then we can see, well, if we do interpret this, um, if, if we interpret rho specifically as a probability density, so uh, the probability within some volume uh, to measure something happening, um, do we have the right to do that? If we interpret it that way, does it make a prediction that we can then test? So. That's the next thing that I want to get to. I'll, I'll take another quick break. I'll look at the chat. Uh, Narf, I see you saying this seems like a cheat. Yeah, so um, of course, if we, if we don't worry about uh, misbeat like functions, if we don't only restrict ourselves to well-behaved functions, then yeah, of, of course this will no uh, longer be conserved, but then it starts to get a little bit sketchy talking about, well, I mean, what what are these actual, what, then these essentially have no interpretation, right? Um, and also things that aren't well behaved at infinity are just that, they're not very well behaved and they tend to be very difficult to deal with uh, in, in a lot of uh, circumstances. So yeah, so sure. Uh, we can definitely see it as a cheat. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. But it, we can also see it as a restriction to these sorts of solutions that we actually care about, care about the solutions which are physically relevant. We'll see. And so, again, sort of, uh, this, this is yet to be shown that this is all physically relevant, and that's sort of where I want to end things. Uh, I don't want to end things here. I just want to uh, hopefully justify, show that we're justified and that this, doing interpretations this way and um, looking at things uh, as probabilities, probability densities, whatever, um, does in fact lead to um, um, does in fact lead to good predictions. It's probably a reasonable assumption that physical systems have physical properties. Yeah, I mean, not all not all physical systems are bounded, but I, I mean, but that's sort of besides the point. This, for ease of solving the Schrodinger equation, will restrict ourselves to well-behaved functions so that we have some sort of boundary condition to put on them. Um, but sure, I, I, I don't think that I, I fully disagree with your argument. Um, it just, it's, uh, it's justified in the fact that, well, when we restrict ourselves to that, we have this uh, interpretation, which then gives us very good predictivity. Say, can you use Schrodinger equations in particle detectors? Um. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good question. So 
It sort of depends on what you mean. Can I use them in particle detectors? So usually what's used in particle physics is quantum field theory, which is sort of a step up from uh, Sch the Schrodinger equation. Uh, you can get some quantum field theories from the Schrodinger equation, but it's, uh, it's, it's very tricky. Um, it's, so quantum field theory this is, I say it's a step beyond because it incorporates special relativity. So um, our, our form of the Hamiltonian right now uh, that we're using is um, is very classical, very uh, non-relativistic. So to talk about particles and particle physics, we have to incorporate special relativity into everything, in which case um, typically uh, you have to go a bit beyond the Schrodinger equation. These are good questions. Okay, so now I, I think I want to move on. And uh, I, I want to talk about... So we, we have that this... Okay, we're calling this rho a probability density. Rho, of course, being psi of star, psi star of psi, where our solutions of the Schrodinger equation are psi. Um, so now I, 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 I will, uh, I will sort of note that interpreting Psi itself is a little bit dangerous. We don't want to really try to interpret Psi because it's weird, right? If we say that Psi star, Psi star Psi is a probability density, then that's telling us that psi is some weird square root of a probability that is complex and all this. So I'm, I'm not going to worry about interpreting the wave function um, or anything like that for the time being. I'm just going to stick with uh, this probability density. Um, okay, Let's see a quick question about type 2 superconducting. Oh boy. Uh, I have a question regarding type 2 superconducting because my dad used to do research regarding superconduction, and as I understand, superconduction happens when the electrons have an energy barrier. Uh, as I understand, this barrier causes the electrons to not interact with the nuclei and only travel in superposition. Where does the energy gap come from? No, no, don't, don't be sorry at all. You're, this is fine. Um, okay, so I, I, I want to say... Um, off the top of my head, I don't feel super confident giving you an answer. Uh, this, that's far from my, uh, area of expertise. Uh, I'm, I'm not a condensed matter solid state person. It's, it's been a hot minute since I've studied, uh, superconductivity. Um, so the the story is typically pretty complicated um and it has to if i'm remembering correctly it has to do with spontaneous symmetry breaking and and all this stuff like that um but uh mm, yeah i i think i should probably uh i i should probably stick with that and not uh say anything more that out of the fear of giving you something giving an answer which is incorrect uh give, having you walk away with the wrong ideas but yeah <laughs> no it, it's a weird effect i i agree but um yeah it's uh yeah That's that's kind of I I think all I'm super comfortable saying off the top of my head. I'd have to I'd have to look into it a little bit more. Um Okay. So what do I want to do here? I want to um I I want to start off by just looking at what happens if I have a free particle. So a particle which can move in I'm going to uh say D dimensions, so we're going to consider a free particle. 
uh, in the dimensions. Uh, and when I say free particle, all I really mean is that my I'm setting my potential to zero. So it's free to move, which doesn't and it's not going to feel any forces or anything as it moves. Okay, so let's, uh, again, as I've said before, uh, we're sort of free to choose our, um, choose our basis, essentially. We're free to choose the space that we work in. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose uh, to work in position or momentum. So momentum and energy space. So sort of the conjugate space to what we've been working in previously. And the reason why is that in Cartesian, in Cartesian coordinates, uh, coordinates, in which case we know that, well, classically, uh, our Hamiltonian is just given by this, which means that my Hamiltonian operator acting on, call it psi tilde, ELE, is going to be, well, just P sub I, P sub I. I'll write it as operator first, P e hat, e hat I over 2M, psi tilde, EL comma E, uh, which then gives me that PI, PI, where these are now lowercase PIs tilde uh, is equal to all this E, by tilde, Isabel comma E, because I'm working in E space, and this is the action of the Hamiltonian on something living in E space. Okay, uh, so now I'm going to shuffle things around a bit. Uh, I'm going to multiply both sides by 2m, and then I'm going to define this quantity, which I'll call kappa, um, so that kappa i kappa i is equal to 2me. So just the magnitude of this kappa vector is 2me. Uh, so now uh, I can rewrite this equation as pi plus kappa times pi minus kappa times psi tilde, whoops, psi tilde of um, p sub l, e equals zero. And this should look very familiar to what we did when we considered harmonic oscillators in uh, when we were working with Fourier transforms or the wave equation. So uh, something that we see is that I can now essentially just write psi as a uh, linear combination of Dirac delta functions, which fix my p to either minus kappa or to plus kappa. Either way, uh, this is going to be satisfied. This equation is going to be satisfied. So I'll write that out as uh, just some well, this a which can be a function of p, of course, times the product i, p sub i minus kappa, uh, plus b, p sub l, uh, pi i, delta p sub i, uh, yeah, plus kappa i. Uh, and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take these guys and I'm going to define them as n-dimensional Dirac delta functions. I'm going to just give them this notation. Uh, it's, it just makes life a little bit easier rather than uh, carrying around a whole bunch of product symbols. So delta n, p minus kappa, plus b, p, l, delta n, p plus kappa. Okay, so now to get things in uh, position space, 
Uh, we just Fourier transform. And when we Fourier transform, these uh, delta functions just replace the p's in my uh, uh, e to the minus i e i x i over h bar. I just replace the pi's with the kappas. And I get something which looks like a kappa l e to the minus i kappa i x i over h bar plus b kappa l e to the i kappa i x i over h bar. Exactly what we might expect. These are just plane wave solutions. Okay, so I'm seeing some questions in the chat. Uh, why doesn't light as uh, as E field and B field just collapse and dissipate when encountering another B or E field? Um, when why doesn't it just collapse or dissipate when? Um, typically, uh, well, it, it, it'll still be affected. It should still be affected by an electric or magnetic field. Um, I, I don't necessarily see why it should collapse. Um, but maybe I'm not understanding the question. But, okay. Anyway, yeah, that, that one's, um, a little bit off topic, but that's that's sort of my quick answer to that. But so this is a this is our energy space uh, function. Where now let's not forget that our kappas uh, are really kappas. They're they're a function of the energy. So now uh, if I want things in the time domain x comma t. I again just Fourier transform e and I just take uh, what I wrote here uh, plus b kappa l e to the i kappa i x i over h bar times e to the minus i h or e t over h bar. You guys didn't lose me again. Sorry for the technical issues today. Um. I don't know why this is doing this to me today. Okay, better. Not going to touch anything. <laughs> Seeing that things are better. Okay. So, okay, so this is... Here we see that these are plane wave solutions, right? Uh, we ran into these when talking about Fourier transforms, wave equations, all that. Uh, plane wave solutions. Uh, and so we usually call psi, I've probably said it a couple of times, uh, psi is referred to as the wave function. Okay, so now all we really will have to do, for a free particle at least, uh, is specify some sort of condition. So usually it comes in the form of psi of x zero is some function of x. Uh, and this, I can then use my rules for Fourier transforms and all that to get um, these coefficients. And at the end of the day, I'll have a function for any time uh, t. 
So here's what we're going to do is we're going to design an experiment, uh, probably an experiment that many of you are very familiar with. Uh, and this is, I'm going to look at what happens if I have a wall with a very small hole in it. And over here, I have some sort of beam, which shoots, I don't know, we'll call them electrons out of the beam uh, with some momentum P. And we'll say, uh, call this in two dimensions. That'll be the X1 direction. This will be the X2 direction. And on the far side, I am going to have a screen. And I want to see the pattern on the screen. I want to figure out what the pattern on the screen is going to look like. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to treat this as, OK, I've, I've already committed a bit of a sin, and I've said that I'm sending this out with a specific momentum. But we're not going to get too uh, carried away with that. Um, the, the issue with doing that is that, uh, it turns out that the wave function that we get isn't going to be normalizable. So we, we can sort of quickly see why that is, um, by, uh, basically just restricting ourselves to one value of kappa here. So remember that kappa, uh, i, kappa i, is equal to 2me, whoops, me. And so if I restrict myself to kappa equals p, the momentum that I chose, um, really kappa 2 is equal to p, kappa 1 equals 0, uh, then I find that e is equal to p squared over 2m, not super surprisingly. Okay, so now uh, sort of just using what we found above, um, we get these plane wave solutions. We get one plane wave for each value of the momenta. So if we just have a single value of the momenta, um, we're just going to get one plane wave. And in, in fact, since it's a right moving plane wave, right, we're sending this, we're shooting this guy to the right, uh, we're only going to get one piece. And uh, in particular, we're going to get something which looks like a e to the um, i over h bar e x2 minus e d. Okay, I, I went through that kind of quick, but it's it's essentially just this equation. Uh, requiring that we only have a single value of the momentum. We're picking out just a single value of uh, kappa. Uh, in other words, we can also say that we require our energy to be equal to this. All, all of this leads to collapsing these integrals to a single function. Okay, and the reason why I have this squiggle instead of an equal sign is, like I said before, this is not actually going to end up being normalizable. We can't use, uh, we can't really do uh, this, really. We have two dimensions here. Ah, e 2 x psi star psi. You see this is equal to magnitude a squared, and this is obviously going to be divergent. If I uh, integrate a constant over an infinite range, it's going to diverge. So this ends up not being normalizable, but we're going to essentially overlook that for this time being, basically saying, OK, we're only going to be looking in a small region of space. We're not going to be integrating over all space. So in principle, if we wanted to conduct a true experiment, then uh, we would have to, you know, have some sort of uh, well-behaved function describing our wave function and so on and so forth. But we'll use this plane wave approximation as just that, an approximation. Okay, so this is what's going to happen on the left side of the slit. 
right? So basically what this is going to look like is I'm going to get a bunch of these plane waves um, where these are going to be the wave fronts coming out here. But then what happens here when this enters the, uh, the slit? Well, if the slit is small enough, uh, then we can approximate it as a point source. Right, so I, I can essentially uh, think of this is, and instead of thinking of it as some junk coming through, uh, I can think of it as half of this picture here, where I have some point source, which is uh, sending out stuff. So again, these are the wave fronts that I expect, but I'm only going to take this half of it. Only going to take the right hand side of it. And so hopefully by this drawing that I've made, um, it, it won't take too much convincing uh, that once it goes through the slit, since we're treating the slit as a point source, a point source is going to have in two dimensions circular symmetry. Okay, which means that we should probably use a better set of coordinates than our Cartesian coordinates. Uh, so what we'll use instead is x1, our, our usual polar coordinates, and x2 equals r sine phi. Just based off of, our, of this symmetry argument, uh, we can immediately say that, well, psi shouldn't depend on phi, right? It should be symmetric no matter which direction I look in phi, assuming I have this whole picture, but since I only have half of it, um, I'm, not, I'm not too worried that I'll only have half of it. Um, our, our wave function should only be a function of r, right, because of this uh, symmetry. Okay, so now it comes down to writing down the Schrodinger equation, et cetera, et cetera. And this means that we have to have this Laplacian. Um, and to get this Laplacian, we can use this definition that I wrote down earlier. I'll, I'll, I'll write it again just for uh, good measure. But it's, it's not too... Uh, I'll actually write it in a bit more compact way that I, than I wrote it earlier. Um, again, going through the steps of this isn't going to be super enlightening. Uh, so I'm not going to really spend too much time on that. Uh, it's just, you know, I sort of plug and chug, whoops, sum everything up. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, what I find is an equation that looks like this. 2m, 1 over r, d by dr, r, d psi dt, oops, d, dr, and again I want everything in terms of this energy space. Okay. Okay, so this is uh this is not quite as pretty of a differential equation as what we ran into before. Um but now I I, I can I can write things out a little bit more explicitly if I um multiply everything through by r squared and then actually hit both of these things with this derivative separately. Um, and actually, uh, another thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce this value k squared to me over h bar squared. And I, I know I'm going a little quick through this, um, and mostly because the independent steps themselves are pretty, 
uh, hopefully simple to see, uh, they also aren't really the main point that I'm trying to get to. Uh, but So when we do all of this, we get an equation that looks like this. Now, again, going back to what I said before, all of this sort of comes down to solving differential equations. And in fact, this is a very particular uh, uh, case of a very famous differential equation, which in general, uh, I'll write as d2 psi dr squared plus r d psi dr plus r squared minus alpha squared psi of r equals zero. Um, this equation is known as Bessel's equation. Uh, and its solutions, I'll just tell you, uh, it has two main solutions. The Bessel functions uh, of the first kind. which are going to be j alpha of r, and the Bessel functions of the second kind, uh, which, OK, alpha of r. The main difference between these guys being that these are regular at r equals 0, and these uh, diverge at uh, r equals zero. Now, I, I, this again, this is something that I don't expect to be obvious. Um, as just sort of a a typical way that this equation is solved and how to find the Bessel functions, uh, you notice that uh, each derivative is coming with the same power of r. So uh, the second derivative comes with two powers of r, the first derivative comes with one power of r, and ignoring uh, this term here, the zeroth derivative comes with zero powers of r. Uh, and we also know that if we take a derivative of a polynomial, it reduces the power of that polynomial by one. So if, again, I ignored this term, I can very easily see that this will have a polynomial solution, right? Because uh, this all has to add up to zero, and so all of the polynomial powers will match up, so it just is a matter of figuring out the coefficients. And this, this, is, the, this is the strategy for solving this differential equation. Uh, this factor of r squared uh, throws a wrench into things a bit, uh, by basically forcing you to get a recursive recursion relation between the coefficients. And again, this is something that I'm going through quick because it's not super relevant to the actual thing that I want to show, but just gives you some insight into how you would go about solving this and finding the Bessel functions. Um, but yeah, so that the Bessel functions are just solutions to this equation. So in general, I can write the solution to our equation up here as a just linear combination of these Bessel functions, really the Bessel functions uh, with this alpha equal to zero, right? Because I have no similar alpha term in this equation. So I'll write this as psi of r is equal to c1 j0 uh, kr plus c2 uh, a0 little kr. A uh, few ways to see that I have to have this k. Uh, the first is that I have this kr here, so that's one way of seeing that I need a kr. Also, the argument of a uh, Bessel function should be dimensionless. And I can go through some work, and I'll, I'll find that the dimensions of k are 1 over distance. And so th this is essentially the only combination of things that I can have, which is going to be dimensionless. 
Now, uh, I want psi of r to be regular, right? The, this is just what we were talking about, well-behaved uh, everywhere, which means I don't want these uh, Bessel functions that blow up as r goes to 0. Uh, so I'll set c2 equals 0. OK? So um, at the end of the day, I can write my total wave function. Um, oh, and, and then from this, I just um, essentially use my evolution operator or I Fourier transform, whichever one it is. Since this is going to have a definite energy, it ends up being the same thing. This is essentially a delta function with the energy. Uh, so I can write this as psi rt is going to be psi r e to the minus i. Well, I can write this as um, u hat psi of r. And since psi of r psi r comma 0, how about? And I can use this psi of r as my initial condition. So u hat psi of r. This is e to the minus i h hat t over h bar psi of r. I have a single energy. Right, this my psi of r isn't a linear combination of energies, it's a distinct energy. So I can just write this as psi of r e to the minus i e t over h bar. Again, this is all very approximate. In, in reality, this is not normalizable, uh, and we'll, we'll see some effects of that um, show up, but um, yeah, at, at the end of the day, we're not too concerned about the non-normalizable effect, or the non-normalized effects. We want to see general trends of this. So uh, putting all of this together, I can write my total wave function as a e to the i e x2 minus e t over h bar for x2 less than zero, assuming that our screen is or our um, our wall with the hole in it is at zero, and I'll call this c1 j zero. Uh, p square root of x1 squared plus x2 squared because it's pr uh, over h bar e to the uh, minus e t over h bar for x less than or, e or greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so that was that was a, I mean. That was a quantum mechanics problem, right? So this is this is what a lot of quantum mechanics is. It's looking at the Schrodinger equation, solving the Schrodinger equation, and then we get to the fun part um, where we get our nice pretty pictures. We can go ahead and plot what comes out of the slit, and we see something like this. Something very nice. Uh, I, I guess I should say, uh, in, in particular, uh, this is the probability density that comes out. Um, so really, it's the Bessel functions. OK. Um, so like I said, this is very pretty. But what's it actually saying? Well, like I said, we want to put a screen somewhere along this. And so this, this gives us our probability density. Uh, this is psi star, psi star psi for x2 greater than 0. Um, and this is giving us our probability density. So now we can put a screen somewhere on uh, at some position x2 and look at what happens with the probability density. And so that's this guy here where the green line, I hope you guys can see the green line, might be kind of faint, but it's, it's the green line is uh, going upwards. 
and the um, plot on the bottom just shows the probability density uh, as a function of x. So you can see that, okay, this, uh, we have some sort of gaps that are showing up just because, and this is sort of an artifact of the fact that we're only picking a single energy, which we're not really allowed to do in, in principle. Uh, but when, we're, when we don't have these gaps, we have um, something which is a, it's a wave, obviously. And uh, for, for most of the uh, time, it, it's peaked in the center. It has, it has a central peak to it. Um, now, it, there are also central deficits too, so it's sort of a question of, okay, how, uh, how much can we trust this? But this question, like I said, comes down to um, the fact that we chose a single um, value of the energy and uh, didn't normalize anything, all of that. But with all that said, I think that we can sort of uh, agree that, you know, maybe if we were to normalize this uh, correctly and do all of this choice of energy well, I think that most of the time we would get, uh, or we would probably agree that we'd get something where the particle is most likely to hit the center of the screen, which is what we would expect classically. So I, is this telling us anything new? That's sort of the question. Um, is, so is anything new happening in this formalism from uh, what we expect classically? That's, that's, that's the question. Uh, is it collapse that's happening? No, so this, this isn't collapse. So wave function collapse is a whole hot topic. Uh, of what it actually means, how it's done. Any of this is just looking at, hey, if I were to put a screen somewhere, what would the probability density look like along that screen? And I know I have a lot of sort of hand-waving arguments in this one, but again, like, sure, we could go with a much more well-defined initial beam, all of this uh, sort of stuff, but for the, this, this approximation is fine. Uh, it just gives us a little bit of weird behavior. So, okay, so this sort of begs the question of, uh, is this telling us anything new beyond classical mechanics, which classically we would expect, well, if we just shot a particle through the hole, we'd see it hit the middle of the screen on the other side. And we can actually see that it is. Um, it does tell us something different uh, by first realizing that our Hamiltonian, so h hat, um, we'll say acting in position space uh, by x1, x2, whatever, minus h bar squared over 2m, uh, sum over i, d2, psi, dx i squared. Uh, we can see that this is, uh, this doesn't change under shifts uh, to x1 and x2, right? It's, as we would say, translationally invariant. So I'm free to shift the location of this hole as much as I want, and I'll get the same answer. Uh, or I'll, I'll get the Bessel function still, all, all of that, just shifted uh, by some amount. We also know that uh, since whoops, h hat is linear, this is something I said last time, any solutions, uh, any linear combinations of solutions to the Schrodinger equation um, are also solutions to the Schrodinger equation. 
which means that what I can do is I can now consider the case where not only do I have one slit offset from the center, but I can put a second slit offset from the center. So this, of course, is the famous double slit experiment, um, where, again, I'll fire, oh, we'll say, electrons at a screen which doesn't have one slit in it and not in the center as well, but it now has two slits. And now I want to see what happens when it hits the wall. Classically, what I would expect to happen is, you know, I might do this a bunch of times and I'll get a bunch of bright spots uh, right around the um, locations of the hole. Uh, but so let's let's just take our solutions to the Schrodinger equation. And uh, I mean, we can very easily do this offsetting and uh, summing and all of this. Uh, and I'm going to run out of room probably because right way too big. So we have the same thing in the left side of the screen over h bar. Uh, and this is what happens on the right side of the screen. We just take two of our solutions, uh, each of which is offset by some amount, which I'll call a, x2 over h bar plus j0 e square root x plus a x2 squared over h bar, and this is for x2 less than zero, x2 greater than or equal to zero. And if we had our classical intuition, like I said, we would expect to see two bright spots. Uh, but this isn't what this is saying. If we plot this probability density, we see something like this. Um, where we not only get the, uh, well, we, we get something very similar to what we were seeing before, where uh, we have a lot of bright spots in directly the center. Um, and this is, of course, the famous interference pattern that we see in the double slit experiment. So again, if we play this same game of taking our screen and pulling it farther and farther away from the, um, the wall, we, we can track our rough probability density. Again, this isn't going to be exactly the probability density because just uh, the fact that we don't have a truly normalizable wave function and uh, all this stuff, really we would have to throw in some extra, uh, some extra energies, etc. cetera, uh, to get something that we might truly expect to see in reality. But again, we see these peaks in the center. We don't see two bright spots. So this gives us a, something which is starkly contrasting what our physical intuition is telling us. Physical intuition says two bright spots. But this whole formalism is saying, no, 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 you shouldn't see two bright spots. You should see, depending on where you put your screen, you should see this interference pattern. But let's remember that this is the probability density corresponding to a single particle Hamiltonian, right? This is important because of the fact that this probability density, I'm essentially saying that this probability density is telling me where that single particle will end up, where it's likely to end up. So what I can do is I can say, um, to get a prediction of what would happen in an experiment, I can fix the location of the screen at some location, and I can fire uh, particles at it, at, at the screen, and basically wait where, where they will end up on the screen by this probability density. And what happens is something like this, where each individual um, each individual particle 
isn't necessarily going to, well, no individual particle is going to have this wave-like behavior, right? I, if I just saw a single one of these dots on the screen, um, I would have no idea that it was governed by a probability density or whatever. It's not until I see a large number of dots uh, that I start seeing this sort of interference pattern uh, and the fact that the particles should be governed by a probability density. Now this is all nice and good, it's very neat and clean, but like I said, it's not the most physical, because in reality we can't exactly control the momentum of the particle that we send in. Even in a classical experiment, we wouldn't be able to do that, we would have some uncertainty uh, corresponding to just laboratory limitations. And so what we can do, we can play around with that, and give the allowed momenta some range. In which case, we get something similar, we still see an interference pattern, but it's a bit fuzzier now. So this is something which is more along the lines of what we would expect to see in an experiment like this. Um, and so th this is, we can treat this as a prediction of the theory, right? This is just a bunch of particles hitting a screen, each one weighted by this probability density that we found from the Schrodinger equation. Uh, so then we can say, okay, well, let's run an experiment. And when we do that, this is what we see. Um, where, you know, this shows these several stages, and by the end, we very, very clearly see this interference pattern showing up. Very similar interference pattern to one that we saw in our little animation, our quote-unquote prediction. A very similar interference pattern is appearing in the experiment. And I, I should uh, give, give credit. This uh, experiment was conducted by uh, Akira Tonomura, um, doing exactly what I'm saying, is uh, firing electrons at a screen. Uh, through two holes. So, I'm probably getting choppy again. Yes. Um, fortunately. Um, no, I, I completely agree. This is, this is very exciting. Um, and so with, with all of this said, we can see that the Schrodinger equation the prediction from the Schrodinger equation. Um, prediction from the Schrodinger equation reproduces uh, the results of experiment better than expected uh from classical intuition and just to write that out again that image is from an experiment from uh akira uh tonomura with um electrons uh electron double slit Yes. So, um, yes. So, Narf, this this is a this is a great point. Um, the the thing that we have found here, right? Let's let's uh, quickly sort of recap this. The uh, the dynamics of the particle, right? So, okay. This is where quantum mechanics starts to get a little tricky to talk about because, okay. There's this whole idea of particle wave duality, all this stuff. But at the end of the day, when we measure something, we measure a particle. We hit, when something hits the screen, it's a particle when it hits the screen. Things seem to behave like particles. It's just that the dynamics of the particle seem to be governed by wave mechanics, right? This wave function is what's sort of 
defining the uh, dynamics of this particle. Um, but you see that the, the, um, the solution of the Schrodinger equation is a linear combination of the solution where it went through one slit and the solution where it went through the other slit. So we can sort of see this, one way to sort of think about this, and again, it gets a little dangerous to say think about quantum mechanics this way or that. You can sort of think of this as the particle traveling through both slits simultaneously, and it's the interference of both of those paths that causes this interference pattern. Uh, the interference arising from when I take the probability density, uh, I'll, I'll get, so if I have, call this psi1, psi2, if I look at psi star psi, I'll get something like psi1 squared plus psi2 squared, plus something that doesn't show up in classical mechanics, which is this term here, which is an interference term. Uh, and uh, we call it an interference term because it's essentially both of these pieces of this linear combination, they're talking to each other. They're showing up in the same term. And so they're, they're some sort of talking to each other happening. Um, and this is what causes the interference uh, in essence. But yeah, I, I, this is a... It's a very uh, good thing to emphasize that A, the particle is always a particle. The particle is never a wave, right? It's not like a photon versus electromagnetic radiation. Quantum mechanics, well, when, when I measure the particle, I always measure a particle. I don't measure a wave, right? It's just the how... Where I would expect to find the particle is governed by wave mechanics. It's very interesting. Um, and so at the, at the risk of getting too uh, near trying to interpret the wave function and interpretations of quantum mechanics, it's, uh, I think that might be a good place for me to stop talking. Um, so... Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll stick around for a little bit longer and answer any more questions that people may have, uh, comments, etc. Um, second probability density picture reminded me of electron orbitals. Uh, yeah, well, that's it's not unrelated. So um, the these are spherical Bessel functions, and spherical Bessel functions show up also in the. Um, uh, in the solution to the Schrodinger equation, or in the radial Sch Schrodinger equation, I do believe. If I'm not mistaken. I could be mistaken there, actually. Yeah, no, it's that's 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 wrong. <laughs> it's it's related. It's a series solution, uh, but it, it's not the Bessel functions, I don't think. But it's 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 a, that one. You have some theta and phi along with it. But anyway. What does it all mean? Yeah, I'm. I'm not gonna. I'm not even gonna touch that question with a ten foot pole. That's gonna. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, so again, this this idea of measurement. Uh, so I, you you can. Um, uh, there, there's a few questions. So. Feel free to ask it, and if it's something that I'll talk about later, I'll just say that I'll talk about it later. Uh, I, I try to, again, like interpreting the wave function, I try to stay away from getting too close into, too deep into the ideas of um, measurement and all that, because it's, I mean, it's not really an agreed upon topic in physics. Uh, there's a lot of debate that happens with it. But if you want to ask it, feel free. Um, yeah, so another question is Schrodinger equations are hard to solve. So usually we use approximate solutions, and that's, that's exactly correct. It's, it's um, I mean, in, in most cases, you'll end up, well, 
most of the cases that we talk about in, say, an undergraduate physics course, yeah, of course they're solvable because they're solvable, so they're actually useful to talk about in an undergraduate physics course. But, you know, the, the set of solvable differential equations is much, much smaller than the set of unsolvable ones, so... Uh, yeah, so, so a lot of times we do have to go through uh, approximation techniques, uh, one of which that's very common is perturbation theory. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there's 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 lots of uh, solution or approximation techniques that give actually pretty decent solutions. Um, and then, of course, you can always numerically solve the Schrodinger equation. Which is still an, a, an approximation, but I mean, computers are pretty good nowadays, and they give you a pretty reliable solution. Oh, da, 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 da. Okay, so the measurement value is an eigenvalue of the operator, but the wave function is not generally in an eigenstate. If I have to pick one of the superpositions by hand, I don't see uh, how the math does it. Yeah, so this is why in quantum mechanics you've probably heard the term expectation value. Uh, so, as you said, in general, we're not going to be in a in an eigenstate. So, for for those that don't know what an eigenstate is, it's um, so it's 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 this what I've been calling the the space that we're working in. So. When we're working in position space and I act with q hat on psi of q, um, I get q i psi q. Um, and this is this is what we mean by the eigenvalue. This this q is the eigenvalue of the operator. And in general, you know, we're not going to be working in the eigenspace or our, our wave function is going to be some linear combination of basis functions, is what it comes down to. And so you won't have a definite eigenvalue. Uh, so uh, what, uh, yeah, so, so what you have is, uh, what we usually look at are, are average values. Right, the average value of the position, the average value of the energy, the average value of the momentum, whatever it may be, and these are these are what we call expectation values, right? Um, because of the fact that uh, we can't necessarily predict uh, what the value is. Now, if I make a measurement, I get a value of the measurement, right? I I get that eigenvalue, and this is the idea of wave function collapse because then I know that the wave function has to be in an eigenstate. And this is that's where I'll stop talking because that's where things get very tricky because the mechanism of how that happens is not actually well known. Um, can you explain attraction repulsion of two charged particles through the evolution of the wave function? And, uh, yeah, you, you absolutely can. Uh, it's, it's, uh, tricky, uh, and usually you look at, so, so this is, this is what the, uh, hy hydrogen atom is, right? It's, it's supercharged particles. Usually you assume that the hydrogen atom or the hydrogen nucleus, the proton is much, much heavier than the electron in that case. So the, uh, it usually doesn't move. But uh, I don't I don't see why you wouldn't be able to uh, do it in just the same way, uh, right? I mean, thinking back to uh, when we were doing Hamiltonian mechanics, uh, we wrote down this Hamiltonian in terms of these deltas, right? So uh, if I'm remembering correctly, it was something like p delta squared over two uh, mu, yeah mu um, plus the angular momentum so l squared over 2 mu r squared or uh, yeah it, it 
you can write down a Hamiltonian corresponding to essentially the, the distance between these two guys and treat that as a degree of freedom and then track the wave function and then that's essentially the uh, evolution of the two particles. Hopefully, hopefully that answers the question. So do I weigh the expectation value by the psi coefficient? Ah, so uh, you're, you're asking about how I actually calculate the expectation value. This actually is something that I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about next time. But the idea is essentially, okay, if I, how do I find the average value of anything? Uh, so if I take my average value, so say I have some, something that I can measure, call it chi. Um, and I can measure values of it chi i. Uh, ah, I, I think I disconnected. Um, each of which with probability pi. It's if it's connected. Ah. Sorry, I think I'm disconnecting again. Try to this out. Hmm. Ugh. Ah, I think it might be back. Um, let's see. Hmm. Can, can people hear me okay now? Or is it still? Ah, back but blurry. Um, okay, I, I think I might... Uh, yeah, I'm, I think I might go ahead and uh, log off now just because of these internet issues. But um, if you can, uh, you can hear me. I appreciate everyone showing up. Uh, appreciate the support. Uh, uh, all, all that. Uh, ah might be back momentarily. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, 